YouTube team, keep it clean. What's going on? It's Engraven here with another video and another episode of NFL questions from subscribers featuring a very, very special guest. But before we get into it, what questions from subscribers is, is a series where you can ask me any NFL question you want to based off of any NFL team. And we answer it in a video just like this. If you want to be part of it, you can send me an email to teamkeepitclean at gmail.com. And for the patrons, of course, you already know you can send it directly on Patreon. And if you want to become a Team Keep It Clean patron, you can go to patreon.com slash engravenvids. And if you don't, that's fine too. Either way, you know I still love you. I appreciate y'all. But without further ado, we got some great questions, but we got an even better guest to answer those questions. Let me let him introduce himself. Team Keep It Clean, a very, very, very special guest uh, on this episode of Questions from Subscribers. We got my guy, Ken who a lot of you I'm sure are already familiar with, Mr. Film Study Ravens. I appreciate you coming on the show today, Ken. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Let them know where they can find you, exactly what you do. Hey, thanks for having me on, Justin. So first of all, I'm at Film Study Ravens on Twitter, if you want to follow me there, uh, or just check in. Uh, and uh, uh, the website is filmstudybaltimore.com, and we have a weekly defense article comes out on Tuesday, offense article comes out on Wednesday, a know your foe the following day by the numbers the day after that. And this year we're doing 25 years Ravens podcast on the other weekend days. So there's new content every day and I hope you have a chance to check it out. Perfect. Perfect. Now, what, what made you get started with creating content about the Ravens? Yeah. So this was about 2005, 2006. I started um, scoring the games uh, and, and I, I looked at it and I wanted to do something different than anybody was doing. So I looked at, uh, defense. There's very little on defense at the time. So, you know, you didn't even really have tackles as an official stat much before then. Uh, sacks were available as an official stat from the 80s, but frankly, offensive linemen and the defense were the big dearth of information. And so I said, I'd like to do something that's different from what everybody else is doing. So I charted who was on the field every defensive play, and I started doing that in 06, and I've since gone back to 1996. I have every play in Ravens history charted for that. And then I have, uh, uh, you know, offensive line scoring that I've been doing now for 15 years uh, as well. So that's uh, those are the two areas where I, I chose to look at. OK, cool. And again, we, we got some great questions like we always do from Team Keep It Clean. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it. The first question on this episode came from my guy Rainmaker. He said, Ain Graven, hope all is well with you and yours. My question today is a look into the future. As well as Anthony Averitt is playing, do you think that will have a direct effect on the Ravens bringing back Marcus Peters? I like the Humphrey Peters duo, but do you think EDC would try to save money by letting Peters go and investing that money elsewhere? We know what EDC stands for and just wanted to know what you think about it. Keep up the great work and stay safe. And oh, that's a, a really good question to start us off because in Marcus Peters' absence, Anthony Averitt, he's been playing really well. Um, and I've been, it's been a very, uh, a pleasant surprise because with Anthony Averitt, the way that I felt about him is that he was so close to being a good cornerback. The only thing that I felt was his sort of deficiency or whatnot was that he didn't turn his head around and make plays on the ball. Mm -hmm. Um, that was the only thing I felt like he, he struggled with. Um, but now he's been doing that. Like he's been having games where you don't really hear his name called. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I love that Anthony Avery has been playing well. Now the impact on Marcus Peters. I, I think that I actually think that Anthony Avery could end up playing himself out of the Ravens and, and his price going up and him end up cashing in, in in free agency since this is the last year of his contract. How you feel about it, Ken? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's a good thing for Anthony Averitt. It's also actually a good thing for the Ravens. But I think it's likely Marcus Peters has played his last game as a Raven. Just looking at the cap structure. Um, the Ravens have to transfer money from defense to offense. That's a very basic need. And so they need a lot of money to pay Lamar. And to do that, they have three major sources. They have um, the departure of Campbell, the departure of Williams, and unfortunately probably the departure of Peters as well because it's one of the few ways they can save a lot of cap next year. Mm. Uh, Tavon Young is a fourth. So, I, you know, I go in into this season, I said the Ravens are short at corner. You know they've got they've got a bunch of guys who are potentially in their last year as Ravens and and uh, Peters and Averett were two but Young is another and then also Jimmy Smith because you know yeah. we we keep hoping that he'll be back every year but it's not a given in my mind so I think it's a great question Rainmaker and I think um, more than likely the two are not necessarily linked and I would agree with uh, with Justin that that it's it's probably a pretty good chance 
that Averett will price himself out of Baltimore if he continues to play at this level for the rest of the year. The next question came from my guy, Manuel. He said, what's up, Engraven? Shout out from Mexico. I was looking at the Broncos game again, and have Team Keep It Clean noticed that our offensive line protection is getting better, especially in the passing game, since Lamar almost the whole game had a clean pocket and was throwing dimes. Speaking of dimes, I can cry with happiness that we finally have a passing game that we also <laughs> desperately needed. Uh, but back to the question, do you think the offensive line uh, with how it's been managing so far gives us the best chance to go all the way? Stay safe and let's hope next year we can have a team keep it clean event again. Yes, that is the goal. Uh, so, Ken, how do you feel about the offensive line, how they've been thus far and how it shows that they can be in the future this season? Right. I mean, the Ravens right now, their big weakness on offense is an offensive tackle, and they, they don't have a player on either side. I think that they completely trust to leave on an island. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they're having to do a lot of things schematically to um, play around that. So they have to, they've used extra inline blockers. Now, I know this is kind of technical, but I'm still going to do it. Um, when you add up the number of six offensive linemen, the fullbacks, and the tight ends, take their whole, take all their snaps comes out to 1.90 per play. That's that's a lot. And they're using a, a high number of set and chip blockers, which means they're sacrificing eligible receivers to oh. cover for their tackles. So, for example, in this last game, they had 40 passing plays, and they used 26 set blockers and 10 chip blocks. And so that's, that's effectively sacrificing 36 of the routes you could run during a game of 200 and saying, we're going to use those as blockers instead. Now, Denver blitzed very heavily in the game, so they really had to do things like that. But mm -hmm. it's it's a weakness that is going to be very difficult for the Ravens to overcome, and they need to heavily scheme to deal with the weakness of tackle. And you know, my honest opinion is the offensive line is probably not good enough right now for the Ravens to go all the way. Mm. And, yeah, that, that seemed to be their uh, Achilles heel last season too, that, that offensive line, mm -hmm. um, because throughout – the entire season last year, even from the first game, the very first game, that offensive line, they were getting blown up um, against the Browns. Because I remember there was one play specifically where Patrick Ricard, it was on the goal line. Uh, Patrick Ricard, they, they, Lamar handed it off to him for a fullback sneak or fullback dive, and, and mm -hmm. he got whacked in the backfield, fumbled the ball, uh, turnover. Um, and then, of course, in the Bills game, with Lamar getting the hit that knocked him out of the game and just it, it ended up being a mess. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they tried to get by as much as they could, but in the playoffs, it just it all got exposed even more. Um, so with offensive line, one of the I think one of the biggest questions for the future is uh, is Ronnie Stanley. Yeah. Um, and, and just his health status. I know I did see something with, with Jeff Zrebic. He, he didn't say it, but because somebody asked, is the is his injury possibly career threatening? Um, and Jeff Zrebic said he heard some things here and there, but he didn't want to get into any speculation, anything like that. Um, but we certainly hope that that wouldn't be the case. Um, first and foremost, for Ronnie Stanley as a person and as a player, uh, but then definitely for the uh, the organization and the team, uh, because that would be a tremendous blow. I mean, it's already been a big blow with him having him out, but if it's possibly career threatening, we just uh, don't even really want to think about it. But the the health of the offensive line. And just their consistency, because I, I just really felt I, I felt like in the the Raiders game, I felt like that was just a really bad game for them, like mm -hmm. from start to finish. But then I was, in the Chiefs game, I was thinking, OK, Frank Clark, Chris Jones. Oh, boy, here we go. This is going to mm -hmm. be a long game. But they did really good. And then in the Lions game, they got back to being iffy again. And then, of course, in the Broncos game, I felt like they were iffy again. So it's just I feel like there's been like a lack of consistency with the offensive line. Um and it's just things have got to improve, but I'm, I'm just I'm not sure how they can improve them uh, because you're limited in cap space. You're limited on guys that are coming back. Of course, Tyree Phillips, he's due back sometime this season. And Ronnie Stanley, hopefully he'll come back sometime this season. Jawan James, I don't think he's going to play this year at all, yeah. but we'll see. But yeah, I'm not expecting this. So it's just going to be very interesting to see how the Ravens sort of get by, uh, how they try to uh, mask. Uh, the offensive lines uh, deficiencies. Yeah, so they've got four offensive tackles right now on the practice squad. And right now they only have one tackle uh, on the active 53. Andre Smith presumably would be elevated from the practice squad again, but he's one of four there. So they have to manage that and basically bring up two practice squad players every week. 
it's such a bad position to be in. I mean, and I'm assuming Villanueva is not going to be able to go, which it, you know, kind of seems like from the nature of the injury that, that he might not be able to, uh, you know, it, it, when, when, when you lose Andre Villanueva and he hasn't played well, and that's still a huge loss for your team, that's a really bad place to be. And you know, it's interesting. I think also Justin, that, that last year, the real weakness was on the interior offensive line. I mean, that they, their tackles were pretty good, but, but this, well, not great on the right side, but, but pretty good on, you know, we certainly had Ronnie Stanley on the left side, but this year, the, the off the interior offensive line has been pretty good. And the, and the outside has been where the problems have been. So this one, this next question came from my guy, Aaron, and it's sort of looking in hindsight, but still want to talk about it anyway. He said, uh, Talofa engraving. That's how you say hi in Samoan. What's up, Aaron? He said, it's been a while since I've been on here. Hope you and the family are good. Uh, thank you for spreading positivity and good vibes. Much love to the rest of the team. Keep it clean, family. So do you think we, the Ravens, make a move? Well, since his past tense, should have made a move for linebacker Jalen Smith. Or do you think we are good with the linebackers we have now? P.S. I remember when you were making videos in the car. Came a long way and keep up the good work. Much love and respect. Appreciate that, Aaron. Um, with Jalen Smith, I, um, I'm i not familiar with his game personally, but what I did, uh, I, I looked up a lot of things uh, to see why did he get cut? Because the timing of it just didn't make any sense to me. But what I heard about him was that he he wasn't the best tackler. His sideline side, his side line to sideline speed was pretty bad. Um, he was getting blown up on blocks, uh, and he, he wasn't um, – oh, and he was blowing coverages too. So – I was thinking, I know a lot of Ravens fans, they were interested in Jalen Smith and, and they were thinking it could be possibly one of those things where, oh, we can, we can change him. We, we can maybe with the right coach and he could change it. It's possible that he could, but it was just never anything that I was like, ah, yeah, let's go get Jalen Smith. Um, but I, I feel like with, with Patrick Queen, no, he's been struggling, missing some tackles here and there. Um, so I just felt like it, it, he wouldn't have really done much uh, for the Ravens, especially with a team with super limited cap space. Um, but I just, I, it, it was a no for me uh, on Jalen Smith. Did, did, did it ever cross your mind that the Ravens could possibly make a move for Jalen Smith, Kim? Yeah, it, it did. I mean, the Ravens have very limited cap space, uh, only enough right now for about three uh, vet men or a little bit lower contracts for the rest of the year. So you got to be careful. Mm -hmm. They're managing their cap on a week to week basis by keeping 50 or 51 players uh, on the uh, active roster. And having the rest be on the practice squad where they actually make less. So they're not protecting these players. They're just, you know, so they're really, I mean, this is, they are down to their last few dollars in their pocket. They're really having to manage on a, on a, on a tight, tight budget. So anyway, Jalen Smith, I don't know what he signed for with the Packers, but I know he signed today. Um, mm -hmm. So, so it, the point is at, at this point, moot. Um, I liked him as both a tackler and a coverage guy, actually. So I thought he would have been a guy who would help the Ravens. And frankly, he might be a, you know, there might be other guys out there that DaCosta likes as much, uh, but I think that Josh Bynes' elevation before it had to happen, I mean, they still had two practice squad elevations of Bynes that they could use. Um, that's a very strong indication for a cash-strapped team, cap-strapped team, that uh, that Patrick Queen's days may be numbered, that, that you know, he sh he's really got to be looking over his shoulder at mm – -hmm. Uh, is my play sufficient enough because because they're elevating Josh Bynes? Uh, why would they do that when they don't have the money to spend? Mm. Mm. And I didn't. Um, I was wondering why, but it, you you made it make a lot of sense. I was wondering why. Uh, for I think throughout this entire season so far, yeah, they have not been at fifty three men on mm -hmm. the roster, and they've had these uh, these empty spots. And I, I just figured like, okay, yeah, it's due to these different guys being injured and whatnot, since they have obviously a lot of injuries, but yeah, that, that makes it make a whole lot more sense. Yeah. It's kind of interesting coming into the, the regular season, we we're doing all these roster breakdowns and, and the Ravens had a lot of flexibility in terms of cutting veterans to make space for a lot of this young talent and some of the injured guys they need to sneak onto the roster and then the next day put them onto IR. So they did a lot of that. And so they have their total mm -hmm. players available to them between the roster and IR is still pretty good. But yeah. the problem is we don't know when some of these IR players are going to be back. And, uh, you know, they need roster spots for them when they do. So they're, they're keeping some of that open. And, uh, and it's it just it's a strange twist of fate. What's happened to the Ravens in terms of injuries? Very, very difficult to put a total cost on it. But if you had to, it might have cost them close to 10 million of caps so far uh, just with the injury, these injuries they've had.
Next question came from my guy, Isaac. He said, hey, Graven, hope that you and the fam are doing well. For my question, it has to do with a possible midseason trade for the Ravens. Uh, Eric DaCosta has been aggressive in the past few years around midseason when he went after defensive additions like Marcus Peters and Yannick Ngakwe. Uh, I think we all know which one of those trades turned out to be the best. Yeah. But my question is, if we're keeping up the trend this year, what position do you see Eric DaCosta improving upon via trade? whether it be offense or defense. Much love to you and yours. Appreciate it. With limited cap space, if they even do go the route of a trade, because it, yeah, with limited cap space, um, mm -hmm. I feel like if they did make a move for somebody, it would be, and it just depends on so much, but I feel like it would be an offensive lineman that's still on his rookie deal. But, wow, it, it, it's really hard to say. What, what do you think it could be, if you even think that they could make an in-season trade for anything? They they have some tools in the box that would allow them to do it. And, and I kind of explained what would have to happen. If they want an offensive tackle, and, and I think that'd be the biggest need at this point, they could go out and get one. The other team would have to accelerate all of the current salary into bonus and eat it themselves immediately. Mm. And then they already, if there's any additional years on the contract, any additional prorated bonus that might be on a player of any tenure, they'd have to eat. So what they're going to basically have to do is compensate that team that, that, that trades them an offensive tackle with additional draft capital for them to say, yeah, that's a good deal, then I'll do that. Um, so it might end up, they, they end up trading a pretty high pick for a tackle who's stripped down to a uh, a minimum salary that they can accept mm. this year. So if if you know it, it wouldn't be out of mind in in my opinion if the Ravens think they're good enough if their record is good that they go out at the end of this month and get a get an offensive tackle and trade certainly a third round pick could be a possibility. I think a second round pick could be a possibility if they Ooh. if they really had to strip down the the value on that contract. Now, just sort of a bonus question for you. Do, do you have any names in mind who you could think of that they could possibly or that you would possibly see them going after? Uh, no, I don't. But you know what? The, the way to figure I always figure this out is go to the teams who are playing under 500 currently and, mm. and look at their roster for, for who their tackles are, and where they are tenure wise, how soon they're going to be lost to free agency. And, and uh, that give you an idea. Whatever player that they get at offensive tackle. Your thing is your your question is going to be wait a minute they trade a third for Yannick Ngakwe and they have to trade something more for this guy you know it's that's what your reaction is going to be to this trade mm. it's not going to be someone who jumps off the page at you it's going to be a league average offensive tackle that you know they have to trade a, a, a decent draft pick for. Shout out to Graven.